Hello, and welcome back to the Meet Mark podcast. And today I'm going to talk about budgeting, which is always a lot of fun. We love budgeting. But we have to do budgeting. That's the other problem. And now, again, we're coming in. Typically, I do it usually November 1 to 15. We want to start to really budget for next year. Uh, in a previous podcast, I talked about planning, which are the broad strokes. In budgeting, we're going to dig into the weeds a little bit. And I'm going to go over our sales. We're going to go over cost of goods sold. We're going to talk about operating costs. And we'll get down, after all that said and done, to our profit. And, of course, we have to pay our taxes. I do. Maybe you don't. I would advise you do pay your taxes. And then we got our take-home. And it's important to learn what your take-home is because that's what you're out there hustling for. So with that, let's start with sales. When I'm talking about sales budgeting or forecasting, it's no longer these broad strokes. I want to look at every account. Maybe that's you look at every account, depending on your size, or you have a sales manager with their sales folks come up with an account by account, look at it. I happen to have my vice president of sales do it, and over the years, I came to really trust what he gave me. And I was, you know, I took it exactly what he gave me. I might argue with him a little bit, but more times than not, he was right. But that wasn't always the case. And in most people's uh, business, it is not the case. Uh, they have to be really um, scrutinizing. And the reason for that is that salespeople and sales managers have a habit of doing one of two things. They budget low or they forecast low because what we call it is padding. They want to get a forecast that's low so they overperform. They get all their bonuses and pats on the back, but they knew they were going to get that. The next one is that they budget too optimistically. And that is they send you the message that they're going to grow a whole bunch. But in the instance I mentioned before, your market typically grows, and let's take a guess, 7%. Well, if the sales folks are coming in saying you're going to grow 15 20%, where? Because that's no small amount of percentage points to take away from somebody else. So uh, my advice to anybody is scrutinize your sales forecasts. Challenge them. Argue about them and make sure that you feel comfortable with where you're going to stand. Then after all that, I would typically sit back and I may tick it down a touch. And that's because I'm a conservative person when it comes to planning financially. I don't like money surprises. There's going to be money surprises that you didn't plan for. So let's start with a conservative estimate for what your company's going to do and hopefully you're going to beat that. In the back of your mind, you kind of know it, but let's not, let's pretend we don't know it right now. So now we have a number for sales. And the next thing is cost of goods sold. Now, some folks, if you're making it, yes, you do have cost of goods sold as to the parts and the like. Our business was more of a buy and sell business. So it would be, what am I going to buy from my vendors? I'm going to bring it to me, and I'm going to sell it to my customers with a markup. And in that, I, I make an assumption of, you know, I'm going to buy it for a dollar. I'm going to have paid 50 cents. I didn't get this luck, luck with my business. And therefore, I'm going to make 50 cents on that. But anyway, when it comes and it all comes together, for us, a huge component of that was, what's it going to cost to get the product? And the other one for us was freight, vend freight and vendors. That's where the big costs laid in our cost of goods sold. So you have to go and probe your vendors. What's going on there? Are they going to push price increases through? Are the freight folks going to jack everything up for some reason or another? And if that's the case, you may have to adjust either your sales or your overhead to keep everything going. Hopefully, it falls in line with your expectations, which you probably have historically some sense for what that'll be. But nonetheless, we have to pick a number because then what we have now is the sales and we have our cost of goods sold. And when we take those two, 
we end up with what we call just our overall gross margin sitting there. Now we have to take out our operating expenses, and the devils are in the details there. In the instance of labor, it, you can go into great detail and pick through each little person and try and figure it out. That comes at the typically at the end of the year. And right now, I would typically go through the roster and the ones that I knew right away that, geez, I'm going to definitely take this person up some. Okay, the balance of them, what I would do is just take a common amount of money that is the common raises, let's say 5%. And for those folks, I would just put in 5% for all the rest of them. Well, knowing that I'm going to have some that might go above, some that might go below, but nonetheless, I'm going to take a 5% crack at that portion, which will then give me roughly a labor number. In some companies, the next one is utilities or a lease. If you're someone who chews up a lot of power, the utilities can be a big issue. It wasn't for us. For us, the biggest issue was, was a lease, and we had to make sure that our lease was being paid if there was any accelerated payments, or if per chance we had to renegotiate our lease. And renegotiating a lease always has the possibility that you're going to have to move, which can be really disruptive. Uh, we did not have to do that, thankfully. We were able to have a good relationship with our lease guy or whatever, the landlord, and we stayed there for some 20 years. It's important to know what those things are. Next up is debt. Early in my business, we had a lot of debt. And we had to have a lot of debt for me to buy it. But incumbent upon me was not only to pay the debt, but to meet a whole bunch of what they call banking covenants, which is mean they want to know what your accounts receivable are. You know, who owes you money? Your accounts payable. Who do you owe money? How much cash do you have in the bank? And they want to draw all these different ratios between those numbers to make sure that you have the strength to continue to pay your debt. And many times, if that strength is not what they want, you pay a higher interest rate or some penalty. So if that's the case, you want to make doggone sure you're going to get hit those covenants. Or if you're not, be aware of it. The next thing up for us and for many companies, is travel. We had to get our sales guys out and gals out there on the road just about every week. Planes, trains, automobiles, running all over the place. Not cheap. So we, we knew historically what that would cost, but you had to make a guess for the subsequent year. I normally like to think of it as per rep. Let's say it's 4000 bucks per rep. And then, to some extent, let them know at a, at a non-budgetary sense, this is roughly what you should be spending or not spending. And uh, I would always say, listen, if you have to go up or go down, that's okay, but we can't have just every month up. And sometimes, if every month is down, that's not good. Because that means the person's not getting out on the road. And we need them out on the road to stay in touch with customers, to drive business. So that's a big one. Is there any international travel? Once again, for us, we had to go to Asia quite a bit, and that could be expensive. If you have to get over there six, seven times a year with different people, that's, you know, six or seven, and you're probably going to go over there, you're probably going to spend seven days over a weekend by the time you get over there and get over all the jet lag. Uh, my attitude is see as much as you can and come back. So that's not cheap. So we have yet another cost there. The next one we have is, uh, for us, was marketing and trade shows. Some people have an enormous budgets for marketing or trade shows. We had a, a pretty consistent marketing budget that uh, was, you know, had a variety of different things in it. And then we had trade shows, 13 trade shows a year. Not cheap. Now, do I need 13 of them? Could I get away with 10? You know, there's a famous saying, I could probably cut my marketing and trade show budget in half. I just don't know which half. And it is a bit of an amorphous, ambiguous number. But over the years, you start to get a sense for how do I run my business and what are those costs in a bunch? So if you have that, you should take a look at that. And lastly, capital. Capital, are, are you going to buy equipment? If you're going to buy equipment, how much it's going to cost, obviously, and how you're going to pay for it. And don't fall for the 
uh, the comment from people or anybody, well, you can capitalize it and depreciate it or you can lease it or you can do all these different things. That's the smart way. That's this way. That's that way. If you're going to buy something for $200,000, you're going to pay $200,000 sooner or later. There's no way around that. There's a million ways to do it that one business or another may find appealing. But reality is cash is going out of your pocket sooner or later. And it's going to be to the tune of $200,000 or more if you're getting interest or a lease payment on those things. I'm sure I missed some things there, but when we're all down that, we had our sales. A, we had a closer look at our cost of goods sales, which is B, we look closer at our operating overhead, and that's also a part of B, so we have two Bs. <laughs> And we take the A and we minus the B's and we got C, which is our profit. Then we have to pay our taxes, which I do. Then we have our take home. So that, that's some discipline that's required, but it's not that hard. And, and if you lock into it, you start to get a historical sense for how your business operates and how you run it and what you need to pay, and equally what you need to bring in in sales, and where you have to hold those cost of goods sold as a percent of sales. So hopefully that helps, and um, look forward to having you listen to a future episode. Thank you, and have a nice day.